going to enter a time of Q&A now. And we have more questions than we have time to get to today. Um, but we're going to do our best. Okay, gentlemen. So I'll try to uh, read these questions to you and be as accurate as I can. And then um, uh, if it will always begin here with you, Dr. Tan, and then um, Sean or Brady, if you have something you'd like to add, uh, that's fine as well, too. But let me just jump right into this, Dr. Tan. There's a question here um, from someone who says, this is my first exposure to Christian counseling. We're so glad that you're here with us today, Jennifer B. Uh, <clears throat> she got her P her PsyD before she became a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, so her question is, um, the suppositions on human nature, are they to be applied only for clients seeking an integrative Christian approach or should this inform how we approach secular clients? Basically, if a client reports that they do well with a humanistic approach, is it our duty to first, is it our duty first to apply our biblical worldview or to offer the client what they have known to help them be well? Okay. Well, my first answer to the good question is that the five assumptions of human nature are true for all human beings. So you can use them even for people who are not believers. You don't impose your values. They just guide you in how you approach people with love and respect. You know, and as uh, Brady mentioned, uh, a, a big emphasis on relationality. Actually, Brady, I mentioned uh, relationships quite a bit in my lecture. So I don't disagree with you. Yeah. And um, then if they are coming uh, at their lives and their issues from a more humanistic perspective, you always start where the client is. You start there. But true true humanistic uh, uh, approaches ultimately will also be spiritual, in my opinion. So if you can respect people for how human and humane they are, showing love, the love of Jesus for them, even implicitly, as um, uh, Sean mentioned, you know, um, the Holy Spirit will work through all of these means. And his story was a wonderful one, where you don't even talk about things explicitly, but the Spirit flows through you. Because agape love is a fruit of the Spirit. And by the way, I have a whole lecture on the Holy Spirit in my third lecture, Sean. So there's a lot more there. But thank you for what you shared. Yeah. So um, just wanted to uh, mention that. And then maybe Brady and Sean can jump in now. Yeah. Sure. I, I agree with what Dr. Tian just said. I think so much of what we do integratively um, is often implicit where you might have clients that don't want um, a Christian approach or might not want their faith involved or might not have faith that they want to include. Um, but I, I agree with Dr. Tan. I think that just being open to the Holy Spirit working in us and uh, naturally we're going to have a biblical worldview as Christians that still guides how we see things behind the scenes. And those two things right there can be so powerful. There's just a lot that will happen anyway in therapy um, even if a client isn't explicitly bringing some sort of religious or faith background into the therapy. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Brady, anything to add? Yeah. Um, I think what I might add is thinking about how kind of that relational part of the image of God in us. Um, we come into the therapy with all of our experience with our faith, just like the client comes in with their experience and Whatever their experience of, of faith or no faith is, um, so starting at that relational level, uh, whether whether we want to say like this is explicitly integrating our, our Christian perspective, um, us being there just kind of inherently brings that to the therapy work. Quick comment, Brad, before we go into the next question. This is actually more germane or relevant to my second lecture tomorrow on explicit and implicit integration. But I just want to point out here because I know a lot of people are watching, do not misunderstand that explicit integration is superior integration mm -hmm. and implicit integration is inferior. I've never said that, but often been, been misunderstood because I talk so much about explicit integration. Why? Because it's explicit. <laughs> it's more to talk about. <laughs> but implicit integration is very important, sometimes even more important. So yes. tomorrow I'll be uh, emphasizing my second lecture that the most important thing about integration is intentional integration prayerful integration mm. and whether it's implicit or explicit or you move in the continuum depends on the client you know sensitivity yeah. to the spirit's leading and the needs of the hour yeah. so remember sometimes implicit integration is the best integration and Xiang Yang Tan said that thank you <laughs> <laughs> it's on video we have it yeah, That's yeah. thank you <laughs> this next question um Dr. Tan you you may come up in another lecture I think you alluded to it but it's a question about could you elaborate more on behavior due to demonic possession versus a psychological behavior, which needs medical or psychological help. If you want to postpone that, you can, or if you want to say a little something here, you can do that too. Well, just very quickly, my textbook, I mentioned four guidelines. I mean, there are many books on, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, Christian perspective on deliverance ministries and so on, some of which are very extreme that I don't agree with, but some of which are very biblical and balanced, you know. So we have to be careful. I mentioned the books that I thought were better ones, Roger Buffett's Counseling and the Demonic uh, and uh, uh, Francis McNutt, you know, Deliverance from Evil Spirits. Uh, but I think that, that, that if you look at the so-called manuals on exorcism and so on, and church history has a lot of this, you know, we must not forget. We psychologists, you know, are not the first ones on earth to deal with all these things. We have 2,000 years of church history, especially in the first 500 to 700 years of uh, the patristic period, early church fathers and mothers. There's a lot of good stuff there that we need to mine and, and, and take out uh, from and take from to apply to our integration today instead of reinventing the wheel. Mm. And the newest, the latest, it's not always the best. <laughs> Sometimes the oldest and the earliest may be wiser because closer to the time of Jesus. So we need to be humble. But my point here simply is that um, <clears throat> in terms of the demonic, there are at least four things that I found helpful from all the manuals and exorcism that I've read. And number one, if there's something demonic, a differential diagnosis, there usually is a very, very uh, a strong and negative reaction to the name of Jesus, or to scripture, or to mm -hmm. him or something. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. Someone who's schizophrenic or psychotic so does not usually have such a negative reaction to Jesus. In fact, I, I don't make this as a joke, but some of them actually believe that they are Jesus, you know, and they really uh, are actually quite, um, uh, what shall I say, a positive about Jesus. So, mm -hmm. so that the negative, strong reaction to Jesus, because it's demonic, anti-Christ, okay, number one, anti-Jesus, anti-God. Number two, if, if there's something demonic then usually there's an overwhelming sense of evil, because it's an evil spirit there. Now, subject, this is subjective, though, but you will feel an overwhelming sense of evil. But I always qualify, unless you watch five Frankenstein movies the night before, ate too much pizza, had all kinds of nightmares, and the next morning, every, everything is demonic, and then that's not good, okay? And number three, usually there's a history of involvement with the cults or the occult in the mm -hmm. context of the client. And I come from Asia originally, from Singapore. We are very, very aware of that, okay, that background. Mm -hmm. Missionaries know about this. And then finally, um, some of the Catholic men will say that there is usually an olfactory smell like rotten eggs or sulfur, but that mm -hmm. has not been as useful a guideline, but I put it in my book. So these are the four. If you have all four present in the person that you're counseling with, you know, it is more probable that there might be something demonic. But then if you sense that and they want to get um, help for that, maybe better to refer to a prayer ministry team, a pastor or a deliverance specialist who has more experience. And most of us therapists, although our Christians don't have much experience in this area, but sometimes you have no choice. Suppose you have a client, especially in third world countries, I shouldn't even say third world countries, any country, even the states, it has said satanic ritual abuse and, and, and worship and so on. But especially in certain types of countries where there's a lot of the demonic that's very, very explicitly manifested. And a client comes in and you're doing the counseling. And before you know it, there's extreme uh, uh, negative reactions and manifestations. You know, you cannot quite say, uh, excuse me, uh, stop, please just leave. I mean, you know, go somewhere else. I'm going to deal with this. I'll refer you. You've got to pray a powerful prayer of deliverance right there and then if you need to. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. You see, we do this very carefully, very humbly, and very discerningly. Not anyhow. I hope yeah. that helps. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Let me jump into another question. Um, um, it, let's see. If Christian psychotherapy's goal is to promote spiritual health and intimate knowing of God, Mm -hmm. How would you distinguish the aim and methodology of Christian psychotherapy from other expressions of soul care, like pastoral care or spiritual direction? Yeah. yeah. Now, remember, you, you have to read my words very carefully. Okay? And I, I know I speak fast. And sometimes you just miss the nuances, like implicit, explicit integration, like relationality. I've already expect, I, I emphasized all that. And it sounds like it's missing. It's not. It's right there. And all the research on psychotherapy relationships that work that I mentioned, Huh? Uh, by Norcross and Rampol and Norcross and Lambert. That's all about relationships. You know? And I talk about agape love, the Holy Spirit's fruit, crucial. Anyways, so um, about uh, the ultimate goal, I say. Not ult penultimate, the ultimate goal, the overarching goal is spiritual health and, and, and coming to know God better. But like Sean gave the example, it's perfect. There are other penultimate goals. For example, helping someone to overcome depression, helping someone with phobias, my area of expertise, or anxiety disorders, or PTSD. You help with all the wisdom God has given you, with all the good uh, therapy skills you've learned, you know, but with the Holy Spirit guiding you, you help the person with deep love and caring and empathy, you see, that will bring healing to them. And then as they begin to uh, heal more, many clients from the symptoms, you know, they will begin to ask the bigger questions. The existential questions, the spiritual questions, what the heck is life all about? Where do I go after I die? They become more and more existential. And this is where the existential therapists are very good at dealing with these things. 
And here's where our spiritual existential perspective from a Christian approach can also be helpful. So I will say that, you know, uh, differentiate between penultimate uh, immediate goals and ultimate goals. The ultimate is overarching. You don't, you don't just jump in the first session and help people become more like Jesus, you know. But as you show love, as you help them, you are already engaging the process of spiritual formation. And the other thing, psychotherapy always focuses on helping people, people with their problems in living. Spiritual direction does not focus on problems per se. It's just your life, okay? And other kinds of formation. Pastoral care and pastoral counseling overlap. Lay counseling overlap a lot with psychotherapy. Except, you know, maybe it's done at a more basic level, okay? Still a caring level. Many of the principles apply. That's why these five points and 14 guidelines I first wrote about in my textbook on lay counseling for lay counselors to follow the research literature and do better lay counseling. See, so good counseling, in my opinion, is good counseling, whether it's by lay people or professional. But professionals have a few more uh, uh, guidelines and demarcations that we have to be careful of. And we do it at a higher level or deeper level, hopefully. <laughs> Although the literature shows lay counselors are almost as effective, I shouldn't say almost, many lay counselors are as effective as professional counselors in the, in the majority of the studies. So now Carl Rogers is validated. Motivational interviewing approaches are validated, meaning warm, empathy, genuineness. Those are more important than techniques. Mm -hmm. And lay people can be gifted with that by the spirit and can, and can be very helpful. So we need to be humble and not claim too much just because we have a PhD or PsyD. The literature is very clear. You don't need a PhD or PsyD to be an effective counselor. Sorry. Still come to Fuller, <laughs> but don't come to Fuller just to be a good counselor. Come to Fuller to get a doctorate, to be called doctor, to be a psychologist, and to be licensed and to do a few more things. Like what? Ah, this is where the unique contribution of psychologists come in. Psychological assessment, neuropsychological assessment, personality assessment. That the lay counselor cannot do. You need special training in that, you see. So there are other things that we do as psychologists and counselors do. I hope that helps. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Sean or Brady, do you want to add anything to, to this, the difference between psychotherapy or Christian psychotherapy and pastoral care or direction? I think that the spiritual growth that clients can experience in therapy, uh, something similar to that, or even maybe some of the same uh, of that can happen in other ways. Uh, but I do think therapy is a, a very good tool that the Lord uses because we have a lot of people with depression and anxiety post-traumatic stress, et cetera, who do need help from a therapist. And so I think that's why we're here. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit can work through us. But some people don't come to therapists. Some people go to their pastor and that might be the only thing they ever they get. And I think God works with that too. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, Dr. Tan, what I might've heard is, uh, I get a free pass on my dissertation. <laughs> yeah, you're still my advisee. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I, I did, I did want to add, but uh, you know, I think, like you said, there is so much overlap, and it it might be like looking at, like I said, you know, at different angles or aspects of mm -hmm. what it is to be human, and kind of focusing mm -hmm. in on particular parts. So, mm -hmm. that's what I yeah, great. This next question is um, is really a, an assessment question. So you you all tell me if you have some thoughts on this. It's a question about if there's been any um, assessment developments determining the level of maturity in Christ of believers. For example, there's some wisdom scales out there now. Uh, do we have any scales on uh, Christian maturity? I, I, they don't all come to mind immediately, but even my book on lay counseling from years ago, uh, besides spiritual gifts inventory, which is a different thing, spiritual well-being scale, which is different, it's, your, it's how you feel about your faith and so on. But how about spiritual maturity? There was a scale on the trying to measure the fruit of the spirit, okay, as marks of spiritual maturity. I forget a person or someone from Dallas or something developed something like that. But again, as uh, Hathaway said recently, uh, more specifically uh, in an article in, in 2018, uh, Bill Hathaway uh, on, on spiritual gifts inventory, that we have to be very careful. Some of these spiritual uh, inventories are not well validated and the reliability and validity and the psychometric properties have not been well established. We have to be careful. However, Everett Worthington has done some very good work, okay, with uh, some spirituality measures, you know, spiritual commitment skill, for example. It's not spiritual uh, maturity, but it, it, it can overlap. Spiritual commitment. How deeply committed are you to your faith, you see? Uh, Wellington has a short 10-point scale, a 10-item scale that has been quite well validated. It's quite reliable. And I would just refer you to a, a handbook that I think it was edited by Ralph Hood, H-O-O-D, and Peter Hill, H-I-L-L, -L, on religious measures. You know, 
and they've updated it in the second edition some years ago. So about 100, 200 measures there, yeah. some more valid, some less. And so I'm aware of that, but I just cannot. I think I've done enough to allude to some of them. Yeah, yeah. I don't have There's exactly too many scales yeah. for any of us to remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm aware that there's a lot of spiritual mat- maturity scales, spiritual yeah. scales that measure faith formation. Yes. Um, and you just have to look very carefully to see what it is that they're measuring. Yes. And let me make, make a, a special uh, comment here to my good friend and, and colleague for so many years, but we both just retired recently, Jeff Bjork. Yes, so an expert on developing some of these scales too. You know, different types of scales, and uh, and, and crossing across uh, faith, not just Christians but Muslims and others. So Jeff has done quite a bit of work here, and of course Kenneth Wang, our director of our PhD program, you know, has been developing scales of different sorts, and he's now in charge of the assessment, a special section of the Journal of Psychology and Christianity. While I'm still continuing to uh, be the special editor of the uh, intervention, the uh, research into practice uh, section. So these are people that you might want to also consult. They have yes, probably great. better answers than I do. <laughs> great, great. Here's a question. Is it true, uh, if it's true, that emotional anguish, pain, suffering is sometimes not due to illness or maladaptive behavior thinking, but sometimes a result just living life or yep. even being obedient to God? How does mm. the therapist discern and help the patient discern when a change in behavior and thinking is warranted and when to consider the posture of acceptance. And yep. by the way, this comes from, and there's a special message here, Dr. Tan. Hello from <laughs> Rob Swanson from 26. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Um, when I alluded to my article in 1987, uh, uh, intrapersonal or personal intrapersonal integration the, ser- the servant's spirituality so I wrote this uh, quite a number of years ago to emphasize the importance of spirituality in personal and intrapersonal uh, integration that's the foundation of all integration in my opinion and of course there's a relational context here okay but you know I don't, uh, let me make a quick comment about the relational context before I forget uh, Brady I'm 100% with you in terms of community in terms of, of relationality in terms of koinonia, in the Greek, you know, fellowships, all in scripture, you know, the body of Christ, crucial. But I will make a new one here, though. We have to be a little careful if we overemphasize human relationships. Okay, I think eventually human relationships are not our final answer. You know, a lot of people have broken human relationships, pain, you know, betrayal, you know, because of, of, of the fallenness of human beings, you see. And that's why our relationship with God eventually comes first, although it's mediated through interpersonal relationships, I understand that. But we psychologists can overemphasize interpersonal relationships or underemphasize them by overemphasizing intrapsychic dynamics too. So that's the whole balance, you see. There's intrapsychic, there's interpersonal uh, relationships, but then there's also that special relationship with God. And what if you're on an island somewhere, there's nobody around, but the Spirit shows up, accepts you, and you, you come to find God. People have <laughs> had experiences like that, you know? So, yeah, just, just that, yeah. But back to your question again, uh, uh, Brad, okay? Can, yes. you, can you just say that again? Sure, yeah, yeah. So, so if it's true that um, emotional suffering, yes. pain, yes. right? Yes. Uh, the how do we help diagnosis, yeah. How do we so help I our clients that, discern, yeah. Yes, I, I think that first of all, when somebody comes in with depression, anxiety, and all the, the, the usual uh, symptom, uh, the, the symptoms, the symptoms are symptomology that they, symptomatology rather, that's the proper English word. <laughs> symptomology is not a, an English word. <laughs> symptomatology is the right word, okay. They come in with all kinds of symptomatologies, all right? And it's there. You see the pain there, the psychopathology there, and, and you discern. And they tell you, you know, I'm really screwed up here. I really need to change this, you know? So you deal with it, you, you explore it, whether you're psychodynamic or cognitive behavioral, you know? But if somebody comes in and say, you know, Dr. Tan or Dr. Braun, Strong or whoever, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. I love the Lord. I exercise. I sleep seven, eight hours a day. <laughs> I eat properly. I take my, my you know, antioxidants, you know, I, 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 I take my probiotics, I eat kimchi and pro and, and, and yogurt, you know, you know, because gut health influences brain health. Now I follow all that. There's something's wrong. And I'm walking with Jesus. I'm in my quiet time. I love Jesus, you know, and things were going really well. Like joy of the Lord, peace of God, apostle understanding. But suddenly, I don't know what happened. You know? Just in the last two, three weeks, I've lost the sense of God's presence. Suddenly I don't feel God anymore. And then I keep on you know, bashing myself. What's wrong? Have I sinned? And so on. And I've searched myself and I don't understand this. Can you help me to interpret or exegete this experience? You see? Ah, that is the clue that there's something more than just pathology and so on. 
There's something deeply mysterious spiritually, okay? Spiritual struggle, the dark night of the soul. And most of these people have not read anything about the dark night of the soul. St. John of the Cross and Richard Foster's, uh, you know, quotation that I said from celebration of discipline, okay? And when they begin to say, oh, you mean when you grow deeper in Christ, sometimes God removes a sense of his presence so that you trust him more for his presence with you, even though you cannot feel him? And like Larry Crabb says in Shattered Dreams in his book, God is oftentimes doing his deepest work in you. He's closest to you when you feel him most absent. See, those paradoxes are things that clients will find helpful. And then support, empathy, prayer, hanging there. And usually over a period of weeks, this will dissipate. But for some people, the dark night can last a long time, you know. Remember Mother Teresa? Her dark night of the soul lasted over 50 years, my friends. That was really, really painful. So that's how I would do it. Do assessment, check out symptoms, look at what's happening, and then we disseminate a minute. There's not much psychopathology here. It's just a sudden absence of the presence of God. That's usually the, 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 the sign that this is a deeper spiritual uh, experience that actually is a blessing in the long run. Mm, that's great. That's great. Okay. Sean yeah. or Brady? Yeah, uh, the dark night of the soul experience is um, very foundational, I think. And there are a lot of Christians who will come to therapy that are experiencing something like that. I think a lot of the work we can do is not only helping them to understand the perspective, but then sometimes like the original person who asked the question, sometimes life just happens. You know, sometimes people have a lot of losses and it has nothing to do with anything they've done. So I think helping clients grieve and accept that loss is part of life can be a way to help people through a grieving experience as well. Mm. Yeah. Great. Anything Brady? Yeah. I mean, you guys have said most of it. Uh, something I might add is just thinking through, like, uh, you know, like cultural or community contexts as well, thinking mm -hmm. about uh, maybe what's happening in the life of someone's church or their community, or even just like uh, the, the country at large, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to try to get one more question in here, and then I've got some housekeeping for all of you before we go, okay? But I think this is an important one, Dr. Tan. Um, I'll read it just as it's written. And Okay. Um, often clients come seeking therapy to feel better without prioritizing spiritual growth and their relationship to God. How mm -hmm. do we as counselors overcome this block in how we engage with them? Yeah. Like I said earlier, always start with where the client is. And most clients come in because they're feeling horrible. They're demoralized. They want to feel better. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. We, we deal with the symptoms. We help with love and uh, agape, you know, and compassion and skill, you know, we listen, we explore, we intervene with the right kinds of interventions, depending on what perspective we are counseling from, whether psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, emotion focused therapy, doesn't matter. As long as those techniques do not contradict scripture, we can use them in, in wonderful ways to help people. But the amazing thing is that when you help people begin to feel better, you know, I, I've had a lot of clinical experience. I worked for three years in a hospital in Canada and many of my clients were not Christians. Okay. And after six months or a year of cognitive behavior therapy, they feel so much better. The symptoms are so much more uh, alleviated. They often ask, you know, can, can you tell me more about this church you go to? Or can you tell me more? I, I have this question. What, was the heck, what the heck is life all about? They will ask the, the spiritual existential questions. Just give it time. Let the Holy Spirit work. Don't be in such a rush. That's why I say sometimes implicit is best. You know? And then the explicit will come out eventually if it comes out then you can deal with that too. So I say nothing wrong with just helping people feel better. Jesus helped people feel better. He healed them, but he gave them even more. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, let me um, pause us there, gentlemen. I want to thank all three of you again, Dr. Tan, Dr. Love, and Brady uh, for your, your amazing comments and responses.